So I've been given uh, strict instructions from Dr. Rahm to begin around five past the hour because we have a limited time in this room. Uh, so I'm filling in for Sharon today. She's on vacation. So I just want to introduce our speaker here for Grand Rounds, Nigel Bush. He's a research psychologist at the National Center for Telehealth and Technology, uh, abbreviated T2, uh, down at the Joint Base uh, Lewis McCord. He's also an affiliate associate professor here in our department. Uh, Dr. Bush came to Seattle back in 1986 uh, when he came to the Fred Hutch to do some toxicology and pain research and was there for a number of years till like 2009 and then went down to uh, Lewis McCord. His uh, current research really is uh, very broad. Uh, it's under sort of the auspices of, of sort of telehealth but also uh, does work on TBI, suicide, and also just general behavioral health in the military. So I'll let That's him it. tell the rest. That's yeah. it. Good morning, folks. Uh, I just discovered, actually, that if I put my glasses on, I can barely see it. If I take them off, I can barely see it. So I'm going to be looking around a lot. I'm, just, I'm at that point in between far-sighted and not. So, uh, so bear with me if I look professorial here. So as, as I was just introduced, I'm at T2 down at microphone down at JBLM. Um, I came from the Hutch. I was at Fred Hutch for 22, 23 years doing uh, clinical research, public health research, you name it. And, uh, and finally thought I need to do something different. So I'm down in the military and that was quite a shock. Uh, it's a little bit of a different environment, let me tell you, but it is really fun. What we're doing. I'm gonna, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you generally what we do down in T2 and then I'll highlight uh, a pilot project that we just finished and submitted for publication. So with the caveat, it's a pilot. We talk here on my slide about effectiveness, but it's effectiveness at the case level. So we're not talking about an RCT with earth-shattering results, but uh, all will become clear later. So JBLM, for those of you who have not driven past it on the freeway, um, this is a big place. Um, it's really interesting how much the population changes from week to week depending on whether soldiers are deployed or not. Um, right now we're waiting for, I think it's the 3rd Strike Brigade to come back. So there, there is probably 4,500 soldiers coming back uh, almost instantly. Changes the, the entire environment. So it can vary from anywhere to feeling empty to up to 100,000 people on base. Um, T2, although it's based in the middle of, of an army uh, installation, is not an army organization. It's a Department of Defense organization. Uh, it answers directly to the Under Secretary of State, uh, indirectly to the Under Secretary of State for Defense. And so we are responsible for developing um, psychological health technology, not only for the army, but for all of the uh, armed forces, for Navy, Marines, um, Air Force. And so we just happen to be based here serendipitously. And as you can see, our mission is to do exactly what I just said. That is to, in, to use technologies, of which I will show you in a bit, um, to improve psychological health, to reduce suicide, and to address traumatic brain injury in uh, armed forces. And just so you know, in case you didn't see them, I left a bunch of, um, I don't know even what you call them, flyers or something like that, with all kinds of links to some of the products that we've already released to the marketplace, to our website, to, and, and so on. So I recommend if you want to know more about T2, that's the way to get to it. So we have a bunch of divisions. In T2 is an organization of about 80 or 90 people now. It's grown considerably in the last couple of years. Um, but we have a number of divisions, but the three pertinent divisions for this talk are thus. So we have what we call P3 on the left. I have a mouse. Population prevention. This is P3. Um, P3 is, is the division that develops some of the more tangible things. Websites, smartphone applications, surveillance applications, and so on. Right now, it's, we're, we're very heavy on smartphone apps. That's where the technology is. Um, ITA, Innovative Tech. Uh, if you've ever seen um, TV features about virtual r Iraq, virtual Afghanistan, and doing psych health therapy, with virtual worlds, 3D immersive technology. This is ITA. Um, on our website, uh, again, it's on the card. There's, I believe it's now up. There's a pretty neat video showing a demonstration of 
doing prolonged exposure therapy in virtual Iraq with goggles, uh, what we call run below vision, vibrations, smells, um, a giant hamster ball we call it, it's a, a virtue sphere it's called, but that you can actually walk inside of. Yeah. And then clinical telehealth, uh, it, the, the, the final kind of active arm, um, is responsible for doing exactly that, it's doing what we're doing today, and that is uh, remote therapy, remote education, remote resources for uh, those military who are in remote locations. So an example is, you can see on this picture here, um, we have shipping containers uh, with uh, clinic offices and uh, communications technology built into them for doing consultations downrange at forward operating bases. These can be driven in on trucks, these can be dropped by helicopter dropped. These can be lowered gently by helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, and they work very well. We're testing one right now in American Samoa and it has, re if nothing else, has reduced costs tremendously because there is an entire battalion of American Samoan soldiers um, when they're redeployed home have to fly to get treatment. Have to fly halfway across the Pacific to get treatment. We can do this with telehealth from here. Next slide. One of the other big things that you'll hear in the news all the time are suicide rates amongst the armed forces. And T2, we are responsible for collecting and reporting those data. So any time that you hear uh, suicide rates have gone up, they've gone down, and so on, um, there are, those are our data, and we provide that information. We collect the information through a, a custom website from uh, authorized um, personnel all over the world who have been designated whenever suicide occurs in the armed forces to fill out, to investigate and fill out a lot of information on background. That all comes to us, we collate it, we research it, and we provide an annual report. The one you see at the front here, the 11 is under review right now at, uh, with senior leaders and will be released, my guess will be within a month. Uh, for That would be for the 2011 data. Here's some pretty pictures. You see I like pictures, I like color. Um, these are uh, just a smidgen of our mobile applications that we're building for military psychological health. Um, obviously I'm not going to remotely go through all of these, but um, a few to note down in the bottom right hand corner, I still have a mouse. Uh, this, this might be uh, interesting to you. This is a provider resilience app. This is built for providers such as yourself um, who get burned out, get compassion fatigue, uh, simply have enough of, of relentless, um, especially in theatre, relentless um, woe. And th this is a, uh, an app that we're testing currently right now in Afghanistan with a, a mobile um, combat stress team um, to see how they like it. Uh, the one next to it, this is the virtual hope box. This is an accessory to um, suicide prevention therapy, to DBT and to cognitive behavioral therapy in clinic. Um, it's, this is a, an essence, a, a multimedia back pocket device for reminding um, people at high risk of suicide of reasons for living as opposed to reasons for dying. But that kind of trivializes it, does much more than that. But that's, that's kind of a, a, a taste of the kinds of apps that we build. Yeah, go ahead. Will, will any of these be made available for civilians? About how they will all be available eventually. They're all free. This is taxpayer dollars that are paying for this. Whenever we're finished with one, uh, we finished one, we're confident that it's safe. It goes on all the marketplaces. It goes on Amazon, it goes on Android, it goes on iOS, iTunes. So a lot of these you'll see on the card at the back again are already available and you can download them right now. Um, next, Military Kids Connect. This is a relatively new website built specifically for children of deployed um, military, deployed soldiers, deployed airmen, and so on. Um, it's that, this is one of the areas that seemingly has been forgotten, that kids have deployed parents. And, you know, we did a, a little survey, a very informal survey, and the data seems to suggest that in nearly every case when a parent is deployed to a war zone, the first time a kid knows that their parent has gone is after they're gone. Because parents are very reluctant to make them anxious before the event is the rationale that I understand. And so this has three sections. It's got, as you see, kids, tweens, and teens. Um, 
whole bunch of stuff. You should again. I'm not going to go through it. Go in and, into this if you're interested and take a look. It's really good. It's, it's for kids mainly. It's also for educators. It's also for parents. Uh, it has things like a lot of cultural information and games about where the parent might be deployed to. And the parent can also communicate with the kid through this and play games with the kid. But the, kid, the children, for example, can make puppets dressed in the local garb and listen to music that's local and so on and so forth. As you can see, it was quite a phenomenon when we put it out, 100,000 users since January. So for this kind of very specific website, that's quite a lot. Every product that we build, website, smartphone application, and so on, um, goes through our usability lab. It's called the Tech Lab. Uh, we have a suite of labs, two-way mirrors, um, latest technology, eye trackers, and so on, for doing iterative testing of every product. So rather than spend a whole bunch of money fixing stuff once it's built, we fix it in small increments as we're building it. And, it, and again, it's a very efficient way of doing business. Um, but with, so that because of that, we're confident that what we release has been tested with the end user, with the target audience, in this case, mostly with the service members. So we get them in, and in three instances thus far, we have gone quite a long way down the road and quite a lot of resources to build an application, and they've said, that's not going to work, and this is why, and we've actually canceled them. So we do take seriously what people tell us. Right, getting to the nub of what this talk is going to be about, um, the, this is the after deployment um, .org website. This is one of our first products, and it's a continuous development process. Um, this, as it says again in, in my text here, this is the, the military's online resource for wellness. Um, this is the gold standard, at least in my opinion. Uh, it is extremely comprehensive website with modules for just about every issue that a military serviceman might encounter. Um, it's called after deployment. Uh, actually, I'll show you on the next slide. No, I won't. I'll go to this thing at the bottom, which shows currently piloting at Harborview, pointing at Doug Zadzik here because he's doing it. So we, we are always opportunists at T2, and we managed to sneak in with his permission the after deployment website to the uh, trauma ward, right? Yeah. Uh, right here at Harborview. We're giving people laptops. Nobody's stealing them. That's yeah, good. There. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But as you can see, if you were to go and look at this, you would see much, much beyond straight psych health, much beyond PTSD and anxiety and sleep. You would see military sexual trauma. You would see financial issues, huge deal financial difficulties. Um, and, and so it's, the intent is that it's much more comprehensive than just a, a behavioral health tool. It has a version of it for providers. So uh, you can conceive of a provider using this interactively with a patient in real time in, th in their um, consultation. They can print assessments, they can send a patient away with homework, um, uh, they can find all the resources they need directly from this. And right at the very end of this talk I'll give you a practical example of our deployment. Here's what uh, a self-management workshop. Throughout this website after deployment there are um, essentially interventions, self-management interventions on different topics that a, an individual, especially those who are reluctant to go and seek mental health treatment because of stigma, because of very real issues, uh, concerns with their career, and so on, uh, concerns with what their peers might think of them. This is an anonymous resource and that individuals can go and actually go through interven interventions that are designed to make a difference. So here's, here's just a nice graphic example. Watch this, this one is sleep module. Um, sleep disturbance is one of the top three or four issues that redeployed service members suffer from. Uh, it's a very, very big, big and serious issue. But I put that there because this is the new look of our website and I, it's kind of pretty as well. So where did this come about? Um, congressional mandate in, I think it was 2007, um, said the military will develop technology to address post-traumatic stress and other things. Uh, it was allocated to T2 and since then we've been developing and it's been spreading and getting broader and, and better and, uh, and so as I said the, pri the priority topic was PTSD. Um, the content was developed by us. We are a large proportion psychologists 
and another large proportion programmers, graphical artists and so on. Uh, it was developed also in combination with the VA, with the National Center for PTSD at the VA, the, in, specifically at Palo Alto. And it uses all the techniques that you are probably familiar with, evidence-based therapy, cognitive therapy, and so on. And then on the right, you'll see, uh, you know, using um, computer technology and applications, sometimes there's a knee-jerk reaction. Oh, let's, let's do something sexy. Let's do something electronic. But there are at least two good meta-analyses that demonstrate that doing these kinds of therapies through computers works, and sometimes works better than conventional methods. So this is what the PTS workshop looks right now. Um, when we did the study, it looked slightly different. You'll see at the bottom here, if you can see at the bottom here, it's talking about six modules. When we did our tiny pilot study, there are eight. It's since been compacted into six. Uh, but don't let that put you off. So here is what's in it. So the intent, obviously, is to uh, reduce the symptoms of PTS, to normalize the experience, to add coping tools and so on. How do we do it? Um, one, the main focus is confronting triggers. Um, triggers might be a couple of, of, of real stories from our base. We had um, a soldier that was caught in barracks stealing toothpaste. And this is the first indication that this individual had PTS. Why was he stealing toothpaste? Because he'd get as far as the supermarket and he couldn't go in the door because of the crowd or because he was afraid of being blown up. So he, he got desperate and he had to steal his supplies from his, his um, fellow service members. Uh, you know, it, it's, again, it seems trivial, but it's very sad. Um, what you more often see uh, with triggers are, for example, those soldiers that have been, uh, soldiers, I should say service members, not exclusively army, marines and so on, who have been in convoys and have difficulty driving down I-5. Uh, especially um, through the underpasses, which was a favorite place to hide IEDs. Um, and so it addresses those kinds of triggers. Uh, it, as you can see, relaxation, problem-solving skills, and then a lot of narrative writing exercises. Um, it incorporates two tools. These, these are, these again, come out of the center for PTSD largely. Uh, relax, identify the trigger, decide what you're going to do about it, and the plan tool, prepare, let go of your worry, accept, and so on. <coughs> and all of this stuff is derived from these, from CBT, from stress inoculation, from ACT. Again, you'll be, most of you will be familiar with at least ACT and CBT. Um, this is a very busy slide. It shows you what's in each module, but we're not going to linger on this. It just, it rest assured, um, a lot of work and thought went into every one of these. So let's talk about the pilot study um, that we finished a couple of months back. Um, it's, a, it's a case level. Um, it says effectiveness, but ag I'll, again, the same caveat within each case effectiveness study of this workshop that I just showed you. This is what the workshop looked like when we did the study. As you see, it's, it's, it's much uh, more attractive, much more sophisticated now. So the aims were to look at the effectiveness of this workshop, this series of modules on PTS symptoms uh, to a lesser extent on depression and functioning. Uh, this module was designed for PTS, not depression and functioning. We have modules for depression. Nonetheless, there's, we, there's an assumption that treat PTS and it treats ancillary symptoms. But as much, number two was to really look at how satisfying it was, how usable it was in the field. Um, just really what people thought about it at the case level. So this was our sample. Um, we took student veterans from San, um, San Jose State University. Uh, one of the team is on the faculty at San Jose. It's a clinical site there. Um, and what, they, what she was relating was they get a lot of uh, student veterans pretty much fresh from um, Afghanistan and Iraq coming in um, on the GI Bill to college with symptoms that they're not reporting. So I'll show you the, okay, so what we did was we screened and took volunteers who scored above 30 on the PCL. Is, the, is everybody familiar with the PCL? It's pretty much the industry standard for post-traumatic stress, at least in our, in our world. PCL, specifically PCL and the military version. Um, and so above 30, 
most research indicates that this is a good cutoff score, a low cutoff score for those who have not seeked treatment for PTSD. And obviously they had to have convenient web access because after deployment is a web-based tool. Uh, these are the measures that we took. These are standard demographics. We also took them um, experience with technologies like how familiar are you with the web, would you rate yourself as skillful, etc., etc. We did the PCL-M, uh, PDSD checklist, PHQ-9, which you're familiar with for depression. And then uh, we incorporated a new brief measure of um, functional impairment um, out of Harvard. Uh, I think this has probably been published by now. It was very close. And what this does is it has a general short form for functional impairment across a load of domains. Um, it also has a long form, and so we chose to incorporate the educational long form of impairment because these were students at college. Okay. And then we did our own evaluation series of questions on, again, on usability, satisfaction, and so on. And we did an exit interview, in-person clinical exit interview. The design was interesting. Um, as I said, this, uh, it was based entirely around self-assessments of PTS, functional status, depression. But what we did was we did what's called a, um, a multiple baseline, single case design. Uh, what this meant was that we enrolled patients, we did one in-person session where they completed these outcome measures on paper in the presence of uh, our coordinator. Then they went away and they logged on to our website, our special research website, once a week for a number of weeks and just did baseline assessments. No intervention. And the number of baseline in, uh, sessions after this first meeting varied between <coughs> two and four. It'll become clear in a bit. So in essence, patients were doing either three, four, or five baseline self-assessments before they even started doing the workshop, the online workshop. Then they did eight weeks of the workshop, which is essentially, there are eight modules in the workshop, so they did one a week um, online with online self-assessments before each workshop. The reason we did them before each workshop was in order that we would be measuring the, pre the effect of the previous week rather than the immediate effect of having just done a workshop, if that makes any sense. Okay. And then we did an in-person follow-up, essentially a mirror of the, the enrollment, but with our debriefing questionnaires and our, our bigger follow-up questionnaires. This is what it looked like. This may be confusing, but let me show you. So in-person uh, enrollment interviews and self-assessments, varying number of baseline online sessions, uh, self-assessments, the workshop, eight sessions of the workshop, follow up. So you can see because we varied it, it staggered the start of the intervention. And the reason for this, this is ideal. This is what is, you're supposed to be able to see on a case-by-case -case basis, not, not over a group, but on a case-by-case -case basis. This is where the intervention starts. So we have baseline, we have intervention, we have follow up here. And what you're supposed to be able to see is in each individual a change at the point where you introduce the intervention or a change over time that's visually um, obvious when compared to the baseline. It's a very visual way of doing things. And, and a lot of the time when this multiple, case, multiple baseline design is used, it could be on a single case and it's a, a very descriptive qualitative type of study. We also chose to do some quantitative <laughs> stats on it. So this is what w it would look like to a patient, a patient to, uh, to a student veteran. They'd log on uh, they would do their, their online self-assessment of our outcome measures. So here's an example. Here's, here's some questions from the PHQ-9. Uh, they'd submit their answers. Then they'd be directed to the actual workshops, the workshop modules. They'd work themselves through the module of the week. Just some examples. Submit that. And then they're done. This is what we would see. So obviously for safety, we will be monitoring this. Our clinical psych at San Jose will be monitoring it for safety uh, and for compliance. Uh, and so we would see a bunch of this stuff. And I have to tell you, this was a nightmare to analyze. We got so much data. Don't be careful of what you wish for. If you want a lot of data, then you have to deal with it. And we had second by second data coming up with this. Right, who, who did we recruit? Um, turned out to be all male, so 11 males. 
uh, aged about 32, which means, uh, and they'd all been um, deployed to Afghanistan or Iraq or both. So when you think about the age, that, that's about average for having been deployed, served one or two or three deployments, got out, GI Bill, gone to college. It's about right. Uh, luckily, we had a very broad spread of characteristic, demographic, demographic characteristics, where all of the forces were represented. Um, we had a broad swathe of um, rank. So this is junior enlisted, senior enlisted officers. Um, and so we were pretty confident that we, we had a nice spectrum there. And their computer skills and their internet skills were high, which is very typical of young males of this generation. Now, this is going to scare you. These are the results, but I'm going to elaborate. Uh, the reason I put this up is these are the 11 individuals. The vertical dotted lines here, this is when they start the intervention. So this is baseline, this is intervention. Um, the the take-home message from this is it varied all over the place. It was nothing like the ideal that I just showed you. Some went up, some went down, some went all over the place. But this is real life, and this is really what it's supposed to look like. Um, and so I just wanted you to see that there's, there's somebody with extremely high PTS. Here's somebody with very low, just above threshold PTS, and so on. I just wanted you to get a taste of what these look like for real. And then I'll show you how we analyze them. So I can barely see this. Um, we, did, we did two things. Um, we compared the slope at baseline. Uh, we put regression lines on, across time. And we compared the slopes at baseline and the slopes during the intervention. Um, the second way we did it was very simple, is we took the, um, the first in-person interview assessments and the discharge, the exit interviews. So beginning, the very beginning, very end, and we compared them with uh, reliable chain in index, which looks at means, it looks at standard deviations, looks at uh, internal consistency, alphas, compares alphas to the other alphas in the literature. It comes up with um, a, s a change score that is quasi-clinically significant, according to the literature. So this is what we found. So here we, have, we found four individuals had significant reductions in their PTS symptoms. So it's 4 out of 11. In our world, that's really good. And these results are already being um, distributed and disseminated and, and are raising some interest. And it's, so it's these four. As you can see, they all look very different. We've got some that are very stable at baseline, and then you can see, obviously, they're getting uh, lower. Some that are even getting worse at baseline and then plummet after the, during the intervention. We've got others that are actually decreasing at baseline then continued to decrease during the intervention, but were very much lower than at baseline. It's a very mixed bag. Is, is 17 still... Uh, is 17 to 85 is the range. So we're using a 30 cutoff. So everybody that we enrolled were above 30 on the PCL. But, but is there, if, if we look back at those, is there, yeah. is there a number at which uh, they're not considered to have PTS? Below 30, we would call it. Oh, below 30. 17 is, the, is essentially zero. On, a P, on the PCL. The, ra the range, because it's scored from ones, is 17 to 85. Uh, oh, where am I going? Yeah, so this is the, uh, the before and after, the simple before and after comparison. I put nice big red blobs here so you can actually see it. But uh, we had six significant changes from the very beginning to the very end, so a dec decrease in PTS symptoms again. Doesn't mean they're better, it means that the symptoms decreased. Not necessarily decreased below threshold but decreased nonetheless. Um, so, and interestingly, some of these were different individuals from those that showed a decrease across time. And um, quickly, we did it for depression too. We found two individuals had reduced depression. We found three had reduced uh, functional impairment. Uh, two had reduced educational impairment. But again, same caveat. Um, this was PTS intervention. This was not a depression and functioning intervention. All right, so as important to me because stats, even within person stats over 11 people, is uh, you know, one has to be very careful about making profound conclusions from 11 people. I prefer to make profound conclusions from talking to people qualitatively and finding out what they actually thought about the, um, the after deployment tool. 
We did standard satisfaction questionnaires. What this tells you um, <coughs> is that pretty much across the board, folks were quite satisfied, found things quite easy, found things quite convenient, were moderately confident on all of our measures. So ability to help you with your symptoms, uh, reduce re uh, or relieve your symptoms, and so on and so on and so on. Uh, the only measure that we had a slightly low, which this is a very neutral score here, was how difficult was it to schedule and go online. We had teething problems with the technology. And what was um, gratifying was how persistent these individuals were in bearing with us while we fixed it and still maintaining their loyalty and staying on, on study. Debriefing, I like this one, 9 of 11, regardless of their scores and whether they went up or down, said they would recommend this to a fellow service mem member with PTS symptoms. So they liked it, regardless of what effect it had on self-assessed scores. Um, again, this is too busy uh, to go through in detail, but what it actually says when you look at, this is uh, in-person debriefing questions about the content of the module. Um, what was really popular and what everybody said they found very helpful was the RID tool, so that's the relax um, and decide, looking at the triggers uh, and dealing with triggers. And they like the narrative writing exercises a lot. Um, found it very therapeutic. Of course, these are students. These are people who write. So, again, you have to look at the context. Nonetheless, we've heard this from, from other studies too, that these narrative exercises, writing about your trauma experience, is very useful. So, so, summary, I'm doing, I'm right on time, cool. Um, as I showed you, we had a very broad range of real life responses to this intervention. So for some, it, didn't, it had no effect whatsoever. For a subset, it appeared to change their PTS symptoms over time. If you look at these boxes, we're starting to think about analyzing the data or doing another study to see if there's a sweet spot of degree of PTS, PTSD. That we had two, these two in blue. This is the very high level of PTS at enrollment that I, I talked about. This and, yeah, two very high ones in blue made no difference to the intervention. They just stayed high. And their responses uh, at the debriefing were, this was great, I'd recommend it, but it didn't help me. Because they were they're way up the chart and probably were they were borderline too high to be doing this study. Um, it, you know, our clinical psych said that it, was, it, that it was within reason, but it had no effect. Then, of course, we had a very low one, had no effect whatsoever either. There was a floor effect or something going on there, but they barely had PTS, so it didn't change it. But is there a sweet spot for the moderate degree right in the middle? This is where all of our change happened. Now, this is the good take-home story. Um, what we've discovered just by word of mouth is that these workshops have been out in the public domain for a couple of years now. And we started to get reports that this PTS workshop and a lot of the other after deployment um, modules on the entire website were being used in practice in, in clinical therapy, especially by the VA, which is where obviously now the wars are apparently winding down. Most of the patients are getting funneled to. Um, and what we're hearing is that um, clinical therapists, psychologists and so on are using this as a tool as part of in-person treatment, group therapy especially, and that they, they are sending away their group patients to use after deployment as a, as a designated work, um, homework between sessions. And in some cases they're saying, okay, now before you come back next week, I want you to do the sleep module, and then come back and we'll talk about it. Uh, we did not promote it this way, uh, but this is the way it's being used. Um, there are people in the VA doing studies on this now that we, we just found out about, which is great. And to the extent that we now have a users group um, that we have every two months, we have a webinar where somebody presents what they're doing with this. And so the way we're conceiving of this whole web-based um, set of tools is Ideally, not as a standalone. We'd much prefer people go in for real in-person treatment for their ailments rather than rely on an electronic tool. 
Now, if they're never going to go in because of stigma or, stigma or other reasons, we'd prefer they did the tool than nothing. But where we see this is really valuable, and we're hearing about how valuable it is, combined with our smartphone apps, we have a smartphone version of our deployment called Life Armor that we'll stick in a back pocket. We're seeing this as a great accessory to clinical treatment. Uh, and again, serendip serendipitously, it's being used that way. So what else do I have for you? I have the final slide <laughs> with a QR code in case you want to play with your smartphones from a distance and see if you can focus on it. <laughs> but it's also on the cards at the back. Um, so this is who we are. This study is under review. Actually, it's review and resubmit as of yesterday. Uh, very benign comments. Changed some of the stats um, at the, where is it? Where did we put it? Uh, psychological trauma theory, research, practice, and policy. I believe I'm supposed to get out, unless you're all going to focus your smartphones right now, I'm going to get out of this because I was told to so that we have the, the fancy doodad that. That's the end of the talk. So any questions about anything? Not, not necessarily about the, um, the study itself, but about what we do. Doug. You know, Nigel, even the, 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 you know, first off, we know it's, it's wonderful that you're doing this within the DOD and in our sort of safety net civilian populations. We just know we'll never get this kind of funding for smartphone apps and websites that, right. that you guys have in the DOD. So we're incredibly, you know, this is incredible work, and we just we, we know we'll never kind of get this even in trickle down. So it, it's sounding like though that that your products are sort of drifting to the VA, and the, the war is sort of in a sense drifting to the VA as, as your population of veterans moves from active duty to the VA, and those folks are more in sort of a civilian mode. I mean, how long have you guys at T2 thought about that, especially in terms of the um, the context of your apps and your websites, in terms of kind of getting more into a civilian mindset, civilian images, is that something you're systematically sort of digesting? Well, we're actively thinking about that right now. It's, it, that is becoming part of our mission. But what I should have said was a number of these technologies we've co-developed with the VA, uh, with the Center for PTSD. Um, they have a similar um, type of development center, albeit a little smaller, in Palo Alto. So you'll see a, a lot of our smartphone apps are co-branded with the VA, and they're designed for both. The other thing we're finding is, in fact, what you're finding, I believe, is that even though after deployment is labeled military all over the place, and it's got images of soldiers, and it talks about deployments, it appears to be quite readily embraced by civilians who have nothing to do with the military, because the principle is the same. The content is very similar. So you just ignore the military label use it. But we are actively thinking about that and we have a number of joint projects with the VA. So it's, I wouldn't say it's, it's going to drift entirely that way. I'm too cynical for that. Um, and we will have an awful lot of career soldiers with issues. I mean, hundreds of thousands in fact, uh, who do not go to the VA, they stay in. Uh, and we still have to deal with a large number of, of uh, active duty career, career service members. Okay, another question. Do you have measures of alcohol and drug use in these 11 individuals? Does that have a bearing on whether they seem to be helped or not? We don't. It's a sad pilot. We could have. We didn't. Um, we have alcohol um, and substance abuse or substance issue modules on after deployment. Um, a number of our apps introduce those kinds of, of related issues. But no, for this one, it was quick and small. Um, it would be really interesting, actually, to see what kind of what kind of prevalence there would be amongst student veterans. Another question? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Functional impairment. We probably wouldn't even be allowed to measure that. We have IRB. You should imagine our IRB issues. <laughs> When we have studies with, with UW and so on that have taken, in fact, some of my colleagues are here from, from UW, it's taken, what, two years to get through IOB, essentially, because you go from one to the other to the other, everything changes, you go back to the start again. Um, now, it, really not the point, and the, I would say, regards to education, a, a very practical issue, that one of the reasons we didn't quite have enough baseline measures to do some better statistics 
uh, is because we had to fit everything into a semester because then everybody goes home. So it was a very pragmatic study. Okay, opportunist. They're enrolling at this point. They're finishing there. Let's fit a study right there. Other questions? Nothing popping up on the screen. And we 15 minutes before we have to get kicked out. Oh, one question then. Have you identified any uh, individual factors that might predict this one would respond or not respond to sort of these telehealth approach? I mean, not only the severity of disease so much, but the Oh, yeah, I did a survey. This is not necessarily predictors. This is more the state of the world. Um, I did a survey last year before last of 350 service members about their personal technologies. You know, one of, one of the baselines when we come in here, we build all this stuff. We don't actually know what our clientele use. Uh, so I did a, a big study. I thought it was very simple. It turns out to be the only one ever done. And so what we found, what I found was that the things like smartphone penetration amongst um, active duty service members was higher than civilians, uh, at least equivalent in most cases higher. So two years ago, when smartphones weren't in everybody's pocket, there was an excess of 65% of soldiers were carrying them, uh, and something like 90% had a cell phone of some kind. Um, same deal with playing games, with use of the web, with... Uh, oh, you know, tablets that are now starting to come in. We're about to repeat that survey online. Um, but anecdotally, we see um, young, I mean, soldiers are young people. They're the equivalent of young civilians. Uh, we have some in therapy over at the Warrior Transition Unit, which is the battalion for injured soldiers and for psychologically injured soldiers um, who have to be forced to put their phones down during therapy. Or, or we had one guy, this may be apocryphal, I was told this, uh, forgot his socks but remembered his phone. <laughs> uh, you know, um, so it's, it's this, this is a switched on population and they're very primed for this kind of, of uh, technology. And when we do the studies, again anecdotally, they all perk up when they say, oh, we're going to be using one of these, cool, let me, uh, you know, can I download it now? And they've already done it before we've started doing our spiel for the study, so it's, uh, we're, we're pretty confident that this is, this is the population. Yeah. I think uh, a huge part of the appeal with this is that you're going to go after a segment of an at-risk population that would not otherwise seek care. Yeah. So how will you um, actually measure that across time, the usage here? It's great when they come in and they're in the therapy session, but what about that huge other portion that has so much stigma they don't want to receive care, but this is a way to actually provide a dose to them. That's a good idea for a study. We haven't done it yet, and, and it needs to be done. It's a long-term effects of these kinds of interventions. As I said, this, this AD intervention is not really designed, it's, it's a stopgap or it's an alternative to good in-person therapy. Uh, but measuring the effect down the line hasn't been done. What I would say is it's extremely difficult to do it in the military because they're so mobile and uh, it's extremely difficult to follow soldiers over time, service members over time, because they're so mobile. They, they, they retire, they muster out, they go on deployment, they get uh, transferred to another permanent base, and you lose them. Uh, just incidentally, I'm about to start writing a paper, with, again with some colleagues from UW, about attrition and retention from research studies with military, because it's really hard to get service members onto studies, and it's really hard to keep them on studies, more so than civilians. So I don't think that answers your question, but I, I guess what I'm saying is, yeah, it needs to be done. No, we haven't done it, but we should. And another question, yeah. So on the app deployment uh, website yeah. that's currently being used, it, it allows you to create a user account, but you yeah. actually don't track the user by individuality. Is that correct? Uh, we can anonymously now. At one point, we were definitely not doing that because we were, we were advertising it as definitely not doing that. Uh, and that's the way you get people who are stigmatized in. And we're still uh, making it very clear that we don't know individuals. We're not tracking IP addresses and that kind of thing. But we can use you know, available tools like Google Analytics and so on and Flurry. I don't know if you're familiar with these kinds of things that allow us to, to identify individuals without identifying IP sources. Um, but mainly we, we, we analyze uh, 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 at the group level anyway. So unless they're on a research study, you, j you can't do that. It's, it's, it's not ethical. 
Yes. Did you compare the tolerability of this for this group given the burden of session they had for this intervention compared to more professional interventions like group PTSD therapy, individual therapy? We did not. This was quick and dirty. Um, that, I mean, the point of the pilot study is to prep for something bigger. And so that's the plan. It may or may not be with this workshop, because it keeps changing as we develop it, PTS workshop. But we are looking to do a larger scale study on one or more of the components of our deployment along those lines. Again, ideally you do an RCT, and we've, we have other RCTs that are grant funded, large scale ones going for other products or other methods, uh, just not this one yet. We have the same resources, although, you know, Doug's talking about the, the resources that we do have for building stuff. We, say we have the same is funding issues for doing research studies as everybody else does. We're able to do some in-house, but for big ones, we have to go get grants like everybody else. Another study, yes. You mentioned that uh, there are a few programs that you guys abandoned yeah. in development. Yeah. Can you speak to some of the barriers that were identified? This is like third hand, so it's anecdotal. <laughs> Um, it would be very simple things like, uh, I don't know a single soldier that would actually turn that on. Um, it look, it, this looks to me like you're collecting stuff on me. There's a, there's a common one. A lot of suspicion because they do get stuff collected on them. There aren't the same privacy laws in the armed forces as there are in the civilian world. So you can say to a certain extent whatever you tell us will be confidential. But to another extent, um, commanders and senior leaders have the right to have access to information. So it's those kinds of things. Some of the more trivial stuff was, well, you know, that looks, this is the army, and the, that looks a bit pink to me. <laughs> <laughs> Which is easy. So that wouldn't have, that wouldn't have prohibited, a, we have to change the color. But it's, it's, it's those kinds of things. It's more the suspicion and the stigma kind of stuff. And that's third hand, so don't quote me. Any more questions? We are veering on 10 minutes before you all have to go back to work. I got to sleep in this morning. But I, I have to get up at 5 to get to the base on time, so uh, I didn't today. It's lovely. Oh, oh, sorry, one question in the back. Yeah, okay. Uh, one behind you. Yeah. No follow-up. That, that no, was part of. Oh, I mean, should we with people yeah, of equivalent? Yeah, yeah we should. Yeah, yeah. We have we have a lot of PTS uh, applications. Not just this one. We got all kinds of smartphone therapeutic smart uh, applications, and um, we are testing with all a whole different range of people. Some extremely traumatized people are doing a virtual reality um, testing. So yes, I think that was a yes. Anybody else? I think we are rolling. Done. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.